Welcome to our Tuesday night class. Good to have you all here tonight. Continuing on the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we'll be uh, finishing that up uh, fairly soon, probably sometime next week. Uh, but we've got a couple more lessons to get through, and tonight uh, we're going to finish up uh, the lesson that our Lord was teaching uh, that we noted on Sunday morning in regard to uh, not having excuses, but now we're seeing the consequences, but also the grace and mercy and love of our Lord uh, in addition. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. So uh, before we get started, uh, any announcements, anything going on? Nothing, nothing on my end, nothing. Any prayer requests that we need to add or anything? <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, all right, then we'll begin. And we begin as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves the opportunity to utilize 1 John 1 9, the confession of our sins, which is an important prayer as God has given it to us so that we are cleansed from all unrighteousness, which means the known and unknown sins that we have committed since we last spoke with God the Father. And it does ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit as we walk in the light and walk in fellowship with God with a cleansed vessel. So, if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and to glorify you now through the study of your word. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done for us and our families, providing for our every need. We thank you for all the blessings, both physically and spiritually, that you've given to us, especially the word that you have for us this evening. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, his great plan of salvation, his word that mightily comes into our soul. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us and enables us and leads us in our daily walk to serve and worship and glorify you. And we thank you for your great plan for our lives and uh, the great plan of salvation that you've given to us and to the entire world. And we can't thank you enough, Father, for all that you have done for us, provided for us, not only in time, but in the eternal state as well. And we ask that you lead us to be encouraged more and more each and every day to walk in that will and in that plan to your glory. So, Father, we thank you again this evening for our great nation. We ask that you watch over it, protect and guide it, continue to be with our president and leading him in all his decision-making authority as well as our congressmen, our senators, our Supreme Court, uh, also our governors, our mayors at the local selectmen uh, at the local level, and uh, anybody else in civilian government. We pray for all of them, Father, and we ask that you lead them all to honor your word, your divine establishment principles, and our various constitutions, and have uh, righteousness and justice be had within our nation according to your will. Also, Father, we pray for the policemen in our country. We ask that you continue to raise them up, strengthen them in, in their souls, give them strength and courage each and every day to go forward, especially those who are uh, being downtrodden. And we just ask, Father, that you uh, give them strength and courage to go forward in their, uh, in their jobs so that the people are safe and they can do their jobs unto you as well. We ask that our nation comes to their senses in various spots, that understanding the importance of the police and the vital... Uh, 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 responsibility and role that they play in the freedom of our nation and the protection of our nation as well. We ask that you bless our nation through them as you have you done in the past. And Father, we also pray for any of those who have been wounded, either physically or spiritually, and uh, those who have given the greatest sacrifice. We pray for their families and we thank you for their service and their sacrifice, as well as praying for our military in the same and also our firemen as well. And ask that you be with each and every one of them and continue to lead them each and every day. Father, this evening uh, we pray for our church that you have your hand upon it, watch over it, protect and guide it, being with all the members of our local assembly, providing for their every need and continue to provide for all of our needs so that we go forward collectively and individually to serve and glorify you. Continue to pray for uh, Tom's surgery. We ask that all goes well in his healing and recovery and his subsequent procedures. We thank you for my mother's eye surgery going well today and we ask for continued healing and recovery there. Continue to pray for Bob Fuller and his healing and recovery and also Mrs. Wenstrom and the Wenstrom family, that they uh, have the strength that they need to endure her ailment of dementia and continue to get her good treatment according to your will. Praying for Peg and Sherry this evening, and ask that you continue to be with them. All of those recovering from the storms in Iowa, especially Todi, uh, Jody and Titus, we pray for them, and ask that you bring healing and uh, strength in their lives and allow them to recover according to your will. Also praying for my son Ben out in Colorado and the fires going on there. And ask for uh, protection there and uh, for those fires to uh, uh, be under control, as well as the one in California going on right now. Continue to pray for Frank's Lyme disease and for healing and recovery there. 
and all the others on our prayer list, Father, especially Jess in her pregnancy, we offer them up to you. And we ask that you uh, uh, work mightily in their lives and give them strength each and every day and allow healing and recovery where it is necessary. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to offer these prayers up to you. And we ask that you bless those that we prayed for according to your great will. So, Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us. So we ask that you continue to lead us this evening as we worship you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. And if Terry would like to come forward for our doxology. <coughs> He has made me glad, yes, he has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, yes, he has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. All right, thank you, Terry, and uh, one and all for the doxology. Now, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. And uh, as we uh, started on uh, Sunday morning, we've been noting verses 15 through verse 24, and the overall topic of uh, this section is, again, God's rebuking of those who are indifferent towards Jesus Christ, really the Messiah, the Savior, in any generation, but specifically this object lesson for uh, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, and also how when people do reject Jesus Christ, their invitation to the eternal state ultimately will be revoked, and they will not be able to enter into the heavenly kingdom. So if they reject these, uh, the uh, offer of salvation throughout their entire human life, once their life ends here on planet Earth, they will no longer have an opportunity to believe in Jesus as their Savior, and enter into the kingdom. At that time, it will be too late. And so Jesus Christ is railing against the Pharisees for having that type of mentality of thinking that their works are going to save them or that their heritage, based on being Jews and having the promises, is going to save them. But Jesus Christ says, no, it's faith in him that will bring salvation. And anyone who rejects that invitation for salvation will lose out on entering into the eternal banquet or the kingdom of God. So let's read this in verse uh, 15, Luke chapter 14. In verse 15, it says, When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who shall eat in the kingdom of God. And as we noted on Sunday, it's a right statement. Yes, everyone who enters the kingdom of God will be blessed. But uh, probably wrong motivation here is he was probably talking about all the religious leaders that were at this banquet and thinking just because they were Jews or they had divine good, or excuse me, their human good works, that they would enter into the kingdom and be saved. But that is a misnomer and it's a false doctrine. Only faith through Jesus Christ enters anyone into the kingdom of God. Now, in verse 16 it says but he said to him Jesus said to him a, and now he gives a parable a certain man was giving a big dinner and he invited many and at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited come for everything is ready now and as we talked on Sunday this is now the second calling as the prophets were the first calling for the people of Israel to come to salvation and now John the Baptist and Jesus himself are the second calling or the servants now giving that calling saying hey it's all ready now enter into the kingdom. And they were rejecting that call, as we see. Now in verse 18, But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And again, we talked about the, uh, the uh, excuses that these three individuals come up with, and I gave you that little quip about what excuses are all about. Remember, they all stink. All right, so in any case, uh, this individual comes up with an excuse, and as we see, these are very lame excuses because he just wants to go look at the piece of property. No real responsibility, no urgency. 
urgency to it, just wants to look at it instead of accepting the invitation. Again, this is the indifferent type of individual who's concerned about their, uh, their business, uh, in, or in this case, their property and their possessions over their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 19, And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. Again, this would be a businessman, again, uh, involved in his work. And I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Again, he's just going to try them out. He's not going to do anything to... Uh, Make sure that they are not harmed or uh, heal them from being sick or in a ditch as we've uh, seen in the uh, parables uh, previously about healing on the Sabbath. He just wants to go try them out. Again, another lame excuse for not entering into salvation and accepting the invitation of this banquet. And so this is the individual who's all caught up in their business life or their work life, and they don't have time for their relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Now in verse 20, and another one said, I have married a wife. And he doesn't even go on and say, I have to do something with the wife. He just says, I married a wife, plain and simple. And then we can fill in the blanks from there and all that that entails from that and all the uh, uh, detail from that. But we also noted in Deuteronomy how when they would be newly married in the ancient Israel, according to the law, they would have a year sabbatical from work or military service. So maybe that's what this individual is thinking about. I've got to go take care of my home, and I'm excused because the law says I am. But in this case, they're not excused from believing in Jesus Christ for salvation. Again, that's the one sin we are not excused from. All right, so it says, another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. This individual didn't even say, please excuse me, getting a little bit more rude, actually. And the other guy, the other two guys at least said, please excuse me, even though they weren't excused, okay? This guy doesn't even do that. I married a wife. I can't make it, okay? Plain and simple. So he gets a little bit more rude, a little bit more emboldened about his reasoning. So again, these are all things that can deceive us uh, in the mind of our eye when we make excuses about why we can't do this or why we can't do that in regard to the spiritual life or coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and we make the things of this world and this life more important than our relationship with Jesus. And in this case, it's a family issue or family relationship making that more important than a relationship with Jesus. And we talked about that on Sunday. Now in verses 21 through 24, we get into the detail for this evening. It says, And the slave came back, or the servant came back, and reported this to his master. Again, curios is the word there, his lord. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways along the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. All right, so we're going to focus on verses 21 through 24 this evening and understand the principles and concepts that we have here. So back in verse 21, it says, And the slave came back, again, after giving the call, and reported this to his master. Now remember, the master is God the Father in heaven. We've seen that in analogy, continuing on here. The servant here, we can talk about Jesus Christ himself. And if we really wanted to read into this a little bit more, we could say after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then his ascension into heaven. When he ultimately ascended to heaven and now is seated at the right hand of the Father in his humanity, remember as God, he's always on the throne, but as uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, at that point he reported back to his Father, the Jewish people have rejected me. And at that point, God the Father then said, let's go out and let's go in different direction and look in different areas and let's invite them into the banquet, as it were. And so we see post-resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, and it's kind of interesting that 
40 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what happened? The giving of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, began the church age. Yes, it began with the apostles who were all Jewish, but then what did they do? Well, they started in Israel and Jerusalem first, but then Paul and Peter really took it out, and the others then that we don't see about in the New Testament, they went out to the entire world. Again, the Gentile world. And they went all over the world and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. This really is the the analogy of that playing itself out. And then at the end, coming back and saying, you know what, those who were initially invited, my own people, the people of Israel who rejected me, they will not be at the banquet, but all these other people will be. So to give a little bit more detail to that, again, he reported to his master, then the head of the household became angry. That's a bad translation, okay? In the Greek, it just says he was angry. And that's how we should look at it, because God does not become angry at our sin or the rejection of his son. You see, God does not become angry in that sense. This is one thing that we would call an anthropopathism. And what that is, is a mental attitude or emotion that is inside of man that is ascribed to God so that maybe we can understand him a little bit better. So God does not become angry. What God is, is just he abhors what? Evil and sin. And he abhors the rejection of his son, Jesus Christ. And therefore, the wrath of God, which also sometimes can be translated as the anger of God, comes on to the unbelieving world as a result. So God doesn't become angry. He just has always hated sin, and he treats it as such, a a wicked, rotten, wretched thing. So became angry is not a good translation. And in the Greek, it doesn't even say became. It basically just says was angry. All right? And said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the fact of the matter is, is what we see here is that even though the initial invitation of salvation was gone, has gone out and then been rejected by the people of Israel, as it were, again, not all of them, but as the religious leaders and as the religious hierarchy and the religion, as we would say, it's been rejected by them. Did that thwart God's plan of salvation? Absolutely not. The plan of salvation continued on. And even though it was rejected by the people that it was originally offered, Offered to, first and foremost, as here to the people of Israel, as Jesus came to his own first. And then even as Paul said, I go to the Jews first, then I turn to the Gentiles, okay? After being rejected, kind of the same scenario being played out there through Paul's ministry. Even though the rejection is there, guess what? The plan of salvation is still available to all people, both Jew and Gentile, for all of human time. And it will continue to be there, and it is still available throughout the entire world. So just because they rejected it doesn't mean it ended, and that's it. No, it continues on. And as I said, uh, I had a slide for this, okay? God does not become angry. Again, he just hates sin. That's what it's all about, and that's what we're talking about. So God the Father was angry with the Israelites for accept, for not accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as their save, as Savior and as their Messiah. And also, we could say, as their king, even though the, uh, the royalty of Jesus Christ wouldn't be uh, uh, enthroned until the second advent of Jesus, in which it will be at that time. But yet, even though it was rejected, they did not accept Jesus Christ. God did not turn his back on mankind. He did not flood the world to get rid of them because they rejected the salvation message. No, the salvation message with the invitation to salvation, the call to salvation continues to be in the world and will always be in the world. And now you and I as royal ambassadors have a responsibility to help God or assist God in that calling because God uses us to have that call go out, to reach out to those who are lost and dying in this world and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the fact of the matter is, is that as it says here, everything was made prepared, everything necessary was brought together and put together so that now the banquet could occur. And that is the preparation that God the Father has done through His Son, Jesus Christ, fulfilling the work on the cross so that salvation could be offered to all members of the human race. And so God prepared everything necessary, and as He did, He had everything that was 
there, ready, willing, and able to be uh, consumed, but yet certain people who were initially invited did not want to consume it, so God then did what? Turn to other people. Turn to others who then would receive the invitation, come dine at the banquet, and ultimately uh, believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and enter into the eternal kingdom of God. So, again, having prepared everything necessary, he turned to others. And that's why we have this age in which we are currently in called the age of the church. And when we rightly divide the word of God, we have to have a dispensational theology. We have to understand that there's a different age that we are in compared to what the Israelites lived in during the time of Jesus and before that. That was called the age of the law. They were under the law and they were mandated by the law now in the age of grace we're no longer under the law as the israelites were now we're in the age of grace but also let me clarify this too because i had this question come up the other day when i said we're no longer under the law that doesn't mean that parts of the law do not apply to us today because we know from the ten commandments that nine of the ten commandments are reiterated for us in the new testament as a church age doctrine So no, we're no longer under the law to keep all of the law in the three codex of the the civil code, uh, the judicial code, and the religious code. We're no longer under the three codexes of the law, but there are principles and precepts that come from the law that we are absolutely still under, and they just now become what? Mandates for the church age. And remember, there's over 300 commandments that are given to the church age believer about how to live the spiritual life. And what to do in the spiritual life. So again, we are still under parts of the law, like nine of the Ten Commandments. The only one that's not reiterated for us, just so I make this clear, for us in the New Testament is to keep the Sabbath. It's the only one that's not given, again, in the New Testament. Uh, All the others are given to us, so therefore they are still part of the mandates for the church age believer. But in any case, with all that said, we're no longer under the law. We're under the age of grace. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Uh, He actually, I'm going off on a tangent on the law. I didn't expect to do that today. But in any case, uh, remember, Peter was given that vision of all the animals that were previously unclean animals. Don't eat. And, And three times Peter saw a vision about these animals and to kill and to eat them. That was God saying you're no longer under the law. Again, those aspects of the law are no longer necessary. The sacrifices, the temple worship, no longer necessary. Jesus fulfilled all of those things. Now you can eat the unclean animals in the church age. So that was one of the proofs that we're no longer under the law when God gave Peter that vision. So in any case, having prepared everything necessary, he turned to others. He turned to the Gentile peoples. And they now would be the ones that would predominantly fill up the kingdom of God. Prior to that, predominantly the Jewish or the Israelite people were filling up the kingdom of God. And the Gentiles people were pagan in false religion. It's funny how things flopped and now the Jewish people become the pagans where they don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the Gentile peoples are the ones that have truly understood that God's plan of salvation has come through the person of Jesus Christ. So... In any case, as he goes on and says streets and lanes, this indicates that the invitation goes out to those who are two things. One, not looking for Christ, and those who are. And Why is that? Well, I gave you the detail in your notes, and you can look at that if you have the notes. But we have the uh, Greek words play, tia, and rume. And those two words, ultimately, streets and lanes, the first one talks about the wide road, and the other talks about the narrow road. In other words, we would say the wide gate, or the narrow gate. Remember, we saw both of these words utilized in Jesus' discussions, not only here but in the other Gospels, of those who are on the wide road, which means they're looking for everything else in this life to save them, but not Jesus Christ. But then there's the narrow road or the narrow gate that is through, or the narrow door as we even saw in the last chapter, that being the person of Jesus Christ. So by using these two words, basically the invitation is going out to those who aren't looking for Jesus. They're involved in everything else in the world, but they don't, aren't necessarily looking for Jesus. And then there are some people who are looking for the Savior, 
the message is going to them. So again, we see the broad brush stroke or the broad brush nature of this invitation. The streets and the lanes, everybody who is out there, the wide road people and the narrow road people, the gospel message, the invitation is going out to them. In addition to that, we also could say by analogy, the streets and the lanes, when we look at that, we're talking about the society uh, directly in Jerusalem or even in Israel. And in the streets and the lane with the bad people, the wicked people, the evil people, according to the Pharisees. And that's where the tax collectors hung out, the prostitutes hung out, and the sinners hung out. That could also be in view, but that's a great view too, because it's basically saying, go out to the sinners of this world and invite them in. And in the Hebrew mind, again, as Jesus was talking to these Pharisees, that's probably what resonated in their thought. That this Lord is sending his servant out to talk to the sinners who are out in the street that the Hebrews have already written off and look down their nodes towards and ultimately saying they don't deserve salvation. We're the ones. We're the chosen people. We're the chosen race. We're the favored ones. We're going to receive salvation or the kingdom, not them. But that is just the opposite of what Jesus is saying. No, the sinner is the one that's going to be invited in. And if they accept the invitation, as I believe they will, they will enter into the kingdom and make up the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to list that uh, group of four, as we noted also in uh, verse 13. And we talked about this before. But as we have the lame, the crippled, the blind, and uh, uh, the poor, I, actually I said it, uh, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, as we have it in that order in the Gospel of Luke. But basically this group of four, and really what we take away from all of this is that these are the downtrodden people of the world and of society. These are the people who are the lowly of society. These are the people who cannot do what? Fend for themselves. Because of their disability, because of their problems and difficulties, they can't provide for themselves, care for themselves, do for themselves. Okay? They have problems. They need assistance from other people, as it were. And this is a great analogy because that's what Jesus is saying. The people who need the assistance, they're the ones who are going to get the invitation. Now I'm going to give them that assistance. In other words, what are we talking about? We're talking about that we're all sinners and we need a Savior. And the ones who recognize that, again, the poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind, that all analogies for people who have sinned. Because remember, as we've talked about, all these, uh, you know, you know, especially the physical ailments, in the Hebrew mind, in the Hebrew thought, was a result of sin being in their life. And even the poor, the calamity that would come upon them, a result of sin being in their life. So these are the sinners too. So in fact, these are the ones that Jesus Christ is going to invite, and these are the ones who are recognizing their lameness, their crippledness, their blindness, and their poorness. And as we even have in the Beatitudes, those who are poor of spirit, you know, will be blessed in the kingdom of God. So ultimately, we see those who recognize that they're a sinner and that they need a Savior. And this is reiterated in the New Testament, as we see in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And remember, every member of the human race is in this category. And we're all sinners and we all need a Savior. But the ones who recognize that and have humbled themselves to say, yeah, I've got a problem. It's called sin, and I need a Savior to overcome that. They're the ones who will be saved. They're the ones who will be in the kingdom of God. Then as we have in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Recognizing that we're sinners and we need a Savior. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every member of the human race. And in actuality, we all need a Savior. So as Jesus Christ is saying this parable, one of the things we have to take away from this is that he's not stopping the Israelites or the Pharisees from entering into the kingdom. He's not reneging the invitation. No, the invitation is still for them, too, because they, too, are lame and poor and crippled. And uh, what's the fourth one? And blind, okay? Especially blind. I should remember that one because we talk about them being blind more than anything else, okay? But in any case, they're the ones, too. They're in that category. And they, too, have opportunity. And that opportunity will be for their entire lives to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. So now as we look at verse 22, 
It says, And the slave said, Master, what you command has been done, and still there is room. And this is a great uh, uh, storyline because what does this say? There's more than enough room in the kingdom of God. There's more than enough room. Because not only this, but we'll see it in just a minute in verse 23. He says, okay, go out and invite more people. Get more in here, get more in here, get more in here. In other words, the kingdom of God has no limits. We have an infinite God, okay? And He is a God that doesn't deal with time or space the way we do. He is infinite, and therefore His kingdom is infinite. And there is more than enough room for everyone who wants to participate. And that is part of the grace of of God. That's part of the great uh, plan of God, that there's more than enough room. Everyone who wants to come in is able to come in. There's never going to be, the house is full, you've got to wait. Okay? There's never going to be, you know, you've got to wait in line like we're doing now with the COVID virus. You've got to wait in line and ultimately, you know, you have 100 people in a store and, you know, once 100 people are in, you've got to stop. Okay? If one comes out, then you can go in. Well, in God's plan, it's not one come out, one go in. He's not going to kick anybody out of heaven. No one will ever leave heaven, okay? They're all in. But they all just keep coming in and coming in and coming in. And whoever desires to come in, God has more than enough room for them. But at the same time, we could also kind of read into this a little bit when he's talking about the Israelites who are rejecting him. And God thinking about the number of people that he made room for called the Israelites that have rejected the invitation And even though he's inviting all the Gentile peoples now, okay, they're still not filling up all the seats that were made available for all the Israelites that would ever be. And in other words, God had a plan that every single Israelite would be saved, okay? He's got a plan for them that they could be saved, I should say. Not that they would be, but they could be. And ultimately, if they would believe in Jesus Christ, they could be saved. And he made enough room for every single one of them. And you go back to what God said to Abraham about the promise. You look at the stars of the sky. Your people will outnumber the stars of the sky. Well, in our day and age, with a lot of ambient light, you look up at the stars at night, and you're like, oh, there's yeah, a couple hundred up there. It's not a big deal. Oh, no, no, no. You get rid of that ambient light. You go to a dark place, like up in Maine or maybe down the uh, ocean somewhere. You look up at night, and you're just blown away by the number of stars. It's innumerable. And then he also said, by the sands of the seashore, every grain of the sand of the seashore. Can you count that? That's how many people would have been in the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God had a room for every single one of them. So if they are not accepting the invitation, and now God is bringing in all the Gentile sinners, as it were, ultimately there's still more room. So go out even further. But again, uh, let's just uh, let's kind of just reel it back a little bit and say, okay, we're talking about the tax collectors and the prostitutes within the people and nation of Israel that you have written off. They're going to be invited in, and there's still more room. Then we get into verse 23, And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. So here we have two more analogies of highways and hedges. And these two are interesting analogies and basically the highways. We're not talking about the wide road or the narrow road. We're just talking about the major roads of traffic. Okay, And remember how Rome, and it used to be said, all roads lead to Rome because they made an incredible highway system. And they had a great commerce as a result of that. But also it became their downfall because it gave the enemies opportunity to come in and, and overthrow them eventually. But in any case... You look at the United States of America and Eisenhower back in the uh, late uh, 50s and early 60s, uh, late, uh, yeah, right, what, 1960 he went to, right? So late 50s. He developed a plan of a highway system within the United States of America, and from that act alone, our commerce just boomed, opening up the roads where we could transfer product and goods like never before. And our economy just went through the roof as a result. And it continues to be prosperous today as a result of that great decision to make national or federal highways the interstates that we currently have. So again, the highways, what is that? All over the world. We're not just talking about Jerusalem and Israel and the sinners there. Now go out to the entire world. Go everywhere. 
Now, when we also have the hedges, we also see something interesting there, too, because the hedges would also talk about the vagrant types of people. And why is that? Well, back in the day, whether they would be an orchard or a vineyard, and typically the Bible just uses vineyards, but they could be orchards too, okay? Could be a field where they're doing grain, or it could be a, you know, a, a, a palm orchard, or a, um, not, not a palm orchard, uh, an o- olive oil, that's what I'm trying to think, an olive orchard or maybe almonds or something like that, okay? But they would enclose their vineyards or their orchards with a hedge, okay? And that's how they would mock off their boundaries. Now, you know, according to the law, what they had to do. Well, they could reap everything that was in the middle portion of their boundary marker, but they would have to leave the corners. So if they had a square uh, 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 vineyard th- or field, they could uh, 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 till or reap, harvest, okay, everything kind of in a circular motion, but they would have to leave the corners. And why is that? Because the poor people and the vagrants who had no means of supp- uh, supplying for themselves Ultimately, they would be able to go to those corners of the fields and reap or harvest whatever they needed to survive. That was their system of welfare back in the day, which was a good system because those people still had to do what? Do some work. They had to go harvest a little bit, didn't they? They couldn't just sit at home and let somebody drop their milk and cheese off at their door, okay? No, they had to go out and do some work, at least a little bit of work to get their food. So again, a good system that God had. But in any case, the vagrants would hang out along the hedges so ultimately they could go in and, uh, you know, reap something from the vineyards to be supplied for their daily needs. So again, we see that analogy as well. So we see the people of the world and the vagrants, okay? Again, we see the poor people, the sinners, the, the, the lowly of the society. That's who God was going after. So as I've already said, highways is the word hodas. And basically this word is interesting because it too is very much related to Christianity as John the Baptist was to do what prepare the way and so again the highway the way for Jesus Christ he was the forerunner of the Christ that servant in the second calling as we would say or if we really wanted to split hairs we could say John uh, was a prophet of the Old Testament times He was part of the first calling, and Jesus was the true servant when everything was prepared. So in any case, uh, we see John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Also, we know that Jesus Christ is the way. As we know, he is the way, the truth, and the life, according to uh, not only uh, John, as we're going to see in a little bit, but also Hebrews 9, 8, and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. He is the way into the heavenly sanctuary. He's the way into the kingdom of God. And again, this word hodas is used there. As well as the way was uh, to heaven in John chapter 14, verse 6. But in addition to that, before the word Christianity came onto the scene and Christians were named as Christians, they used to call themselves what? The way. Okay, because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So they would call themselves the way, the way. And ultimately they were following the way. And that way was what? Jesus Christ himself. But then later on, uh, they had the term Christians be given to them. So we see that in Acts chapter two, uh, nine, verse two, and also 22 in verse four. Looking at a couple of those verses, Mark 1, uh, 2, it says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And again, a prophecy from Isaiah fulfilled by John. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. And then also in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1, Matthew eleven ten, and Luke chapter 7, verse 27. Then we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. Again, dying on the cross, taking on our sins in his humanity. Then we have this word hedges, and this word too is used in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, in Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 14, where it says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the what? The barrier of the dividing wall. And remember, when we studied the book of Ephesians, we studied this out, and we noted how in the temple they used to have a wall that divided the Jews from the Gentiles. And the cross of Jesus Christ has broken that down. No more Jew, no more Gentile. We are now one 
in Christ. So the hedge, as we have here translated in our passage, go out into the hedges, also speaks to Jesus Christ breaking down the dividing barrier of the wall that the Jews had built to separate the Gentiles from themselves uh, because they thought that they were the more chosen people and had the right to the kingdom. And we'll maybe throw a few scraps of the Gentiles over here. But no, now the Jew and the Gentile, the wall has been broken down, the hedge has been torn down, and now all have entrance or access into the kingdom of God in equal privilege and in equal opportunity. So God desires that heaven be jam-packed, and that's what it's all about. He can't get enough people into heaven, okay? He wishes every member of the human race that was ever born and every member of the angelic race that was ever created would be in heaven for all of eternity. That's his desire. But yet he allows in his righteousness and his justice the free will of angels and man. And man with his free will can choose for God or against God. And unfortunately, when they choose against God and God's plan of salvation, they will not be in the kingdom. But yet if they choose for Jesus Christ, they will be in the kingdom of God. God desires that all members of the human race, he doesn't want to lose one, but he desires that all, and even for those who do choose, heaven still is going to be what? Jam-packed. Again, the room was not full by the local sinners. Now go out into the world and get all those sinners too and have all them come into the party. Let all of them come in and fill up my banquet Paul. In other words, fill up the kingdom of heaven. So that is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions, or many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And God knows every member of the human race who will believe and be entered into the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ is in heaven preparing that place for every member. He probably did it in eternity past, but he's saying it like it's real time, okay? He's preparing it for us, and he's doing it in real time. And that's why Jesus Christ is the great creator. He created the heavens and the earth as we know. And as such, he's also creating the dwelling place. My Father's house and many dwelling places were not so, I would not have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And the creative act of Jesus Christ, he's creating our dwelling individually that we will reside in for all of eternity. All right, so in verse 24, then we see, and here's the exclusion aspect, and it's not that God is not allowing them in, it's that they choose not to come. It says, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And again, of those invited, again, all of those who didn't come. And again, in this analogy, we have the three examples of one had to go look at his land, the other had to go try out his oxen, and the other had a wife, plain and simple, okay, and couldn't make it. Please excuse me, or I'm not coming, okay, was the third guy, as we know. But even with that, those are the individuals who will not be entering into the kingdom. Why? Because they rejected the invitation. And as we've also said, there was a first invitation, now there's a second invitation. They had plenty of information, and they said, yeah, we're going to be part of it. Yeah, we're going to be part of it. We're going to come, we're going to come, we're going to come. But yet when the calling came out, they said, no, nope, no thanks, I don't want it. In other words, through the prophets and the law, they said, yeah, we want to be saved. We want to go to the kingdom. We want to enter into heaven. But then when Jesus came, when the final preparation called Jesus Christ came on the scene, they said, oh, no way, count me out. I can't accept that individual. And they rejected Jesus, and as a result, they rejected God's invitation, his plan of salvation, and they will be uh, barred entrance in the eternal state. So the no entrance to scenario for those who do not believe is in view. And those who recognize that they are a sinner and need a Savior, they will enter into the kingdom of God. And those who think that they are well, they do not look for a savior, and as Jesus Christ said, I've uh, you know uh, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick they do, and I've come to heal the sick. In other words, the sinner, which is all members of the human race, but especially those who recognize they're a sinner and they need a savior. 
So as we have in Matthew chapter 21, in verse 31 specifically, it says, which of the two did the will of the Father? They said the first. Jesus, uh, uh, they said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. So again, we see Jesus Christ talking about who will be in the kingdom and who will not. These individuals who rejected salvation, uh, they will not get into the kingdom, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes, the lowest of society, the streets and the, and the lanes, those types of individuals, they're going to enter in because they're sinners and they recognize that and they've also recognized the Savior who has overcome their sins. So... If by pursuing their own agendas, as these Pharisees were doing, through my good works, through my religion, through my hereditary, or heritage, I should say, through my heritage, okay, through all of that, I should be in the kingdom of God. God will say to them, no way, no how, and not today. And when they stand before the great white throne judgment seat and the works are judged and their name is found to not be in the book of life, they will not be given entrance into the kingdom of God, even though, as we've seen in our previous verses, they will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets dining in that place, their fellow countrymen. But it's not about heritage, it's about faith. And that's what these individuals are lacking, the faith, the compassion, the mercy, and the love. And with all of that, they're not recognizing that they're a Savior that, that needs, uh, uh, excuse me, not recognizing that they're sinners that need a Savior. And instead, they're recognizing their own good works and their own, again, heritage and promises that were given to them as a people and as a nation. But remember, all of those promises only came with faith, again, they would not get into heaven if they did not have faith, even though the promises were given, because all the promises had stipulation of faith. So if by pursuing their own agendas, they do not respond to the gracious call and join in the banquet, then their place at the table is going to be given to who? Someone else. Someone else is going to get that place. And as it says here, it was prepared for the Israelites. It was prepared for all of them. And even though his servants went out and invited other in, called the sinners, and then they went out, that still didn't fill it up, so they went out even further to the entire world and invited all of them in as well. And they will fill up the banquet table, and they will fill up the banquet hall, they will fill up the eternal heaven, and they will reside in that place for all of eternity, and they will take the seats that otherwise should have been occupied by believing Israelites, but because they rejected the Messiah, they will not be in that place. So it's a dire thing not to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they are going to lose out much in not only this life, but in the eternal life as well. As Luke chapter 13, verse 29 through 30 told us, they will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. And as it says, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. That second part, the first were the Israelites. They thought they were the first to the kingdom of heaven, and then the Gentiles would follow. That's kind of the dividing barrier in the temple. We're first, you guys are all second. And that's how it's going to be in the kingdom. And we're going to be leading and ruling, and you are going to be following us in that kingdom. Jesus Christ is flipping it around and saying, you know what? Those who you consider to be last, they're going to be first in the kingdom of God. And some that uh, thought that they were first ultimately will be last, which in that analogy we talked about won't even be included in the kingdom of God and instead assigned to the eternal lake of fire. So only those who believe in Jesus Christ will find a place at the table and they will all be places of honor for whoever enters either Jew or Gentile. And remember this, that even during the age of the law and prior to that, which was called the age of the Gentiles from Adam uh, and, uh, coming, and the woman coming out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve now coming forward, all the way down to the time of Moses when they received the law, all of those Gentile peoples also had a place at the table. 
And anyone who would believe during that time, they would be part of the angelic realm, excuse me, of the heavenly realm, which is also part of the angelic realm, but they weren't beat angels, okay? But in any case, those who were part of the law, the age of the law, even though they were Gentiles, if they believed in God's plan of salvation, they too would be in the eternal state. So don't think that the Gentile thing is something new to this age. No, it's always been there, and it's always been available to the Jew and the Gentile. But ultimately, God chose out his people, the Jews, to be the ambassadors and the witnesses to the world and to demonstrate the world what a relationship with God is all about. So this concludes the teachings of Jesus while he was at the Jewish leader's banquet. And the banquet didn't quite turn out how the Jewish leader wanted it to, did it now? Now, the banquet, uh, uh, the, 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 the leading Pharisee wanted this banquet to be all about what? Catching Jesus in a false or a lie, or something, catching him in something where they could discredit him and then ultimately get rid of him or destroy him. But it didn't quite turn out that way. And in fact, when we see Jesus Christ in these various parables and storylines that he's giving, it gets a little more intense, a little more intense, a little more intense all the way along, speaking to the entire uh, uh, banquet crowd and then speaking also directly to the one who was the host and railing at them, rebuking them, and basically telling them that they would not be part of the kingdom of God. And as they tried to catch Jesus, ultimately Jesus caught them in their falsehood and in their lie, in their false belief, and totally destroyed the mentality that they were thinking. Totally nullified their entrapment and basically let them know and put them on notice that they now were under the gun. And it was up to them to change their mode of operation to believe in Jesus as the Savior. Otherwise, they would be excluded from the kingdom of God. And so as that continued on, again, Jesus Christ gave message after message after message, telling that these individuals could be excluded from the kingdom of God and all of those that they thought would be not in the kingdom of God and initially excluded would now be entered in. And as God would turn from the Jewish people to the Gentile people to be his spokesman going forward during the church age. Go out into the streets and the lanes, go out into the highways and the hedges and bring those people in. Those people who are Jews and Gentiles, but all of them being sinners who recognize that they need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. So as you and I go out in our world, in our day and age, there's a lot of lost people that are in the darkness, blind, lame, crippled, uh, poor, ultimately we have the responsibility to go to them and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ and give them the invitation and help them to recognize that as you were, they too are sinners that need a Savior. And with that knowledge and understanding and humility, recognize that their Savior has come, the banquet has been prepared, it's laid out for them called the cross of Jesus Christ, and whoever would eat his flesh and drink his blood, which means believe in him, would have everlasting life. And they too can enter into the banquet and the eternal kingdom of God. So that's our responsibility now as believers, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, to go out and give that message far and wide. So let's go out and do that starting right now. All right, so let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this great parable and the understanding of the great plan of salvation and the invitation that you give to all. And Father, we just pray for the Jewish people and the Gentile peoples all around the world who are lost and dying. And we ask that the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, be presented to them uh, openly and boldly and brightly so that they know that they have a Savior waiting for them and that they too can enter into the eternal kingdom of God and help them to have faith to overcome their sin so that they can recognize the Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we ask that you also help us to be part of that message giving as we go forward in our daily walk. Also, Father, we pray for our travel blessings home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.